History of Ancient Egypt, from the beginnings to the late antique period. Welcome to my video, designed for those who seek a concise yet factual understanding of ancient Egypt's history without the need to delve into extensive research or academic studies. This is for the curious minds planning a trip to Egypt, or anyone interested in history who doesn't necessarily aspire to be an Egyptologist or historian. My goal was to provide an educational overview accessible to all. In this video, we should first acknowledge the incredible length of ancient Egyptian history. To put it in perspective, Alexander the Great's conquests, though ancient to us, are closer in time to our present day than to the founding of Egypt's first dynasty. This vastness necessitates a simplified narration, as we consider that a generation today spans about 30 years, while lifespans were much shorter in ancient times. We'll also examine the concept of intermediate periods in Egyptian history, which often span over a century, sometimes even longer than the period since the American Civil War. Additionally, the era from 1000 BC to 332 BC, marked by significant invasions and transformations, will be distilled for clarity, paralleling the length of the medieval period in modern times. Furthermore, the story of Cleopatra, the famed female pharaoh and her romantic entanglements with Julius Caesar and later Marcus Antonius, occurred nearly 1,000 years closer to us than the beginnings of Egypt's Old Kingdom. When the Romans, who ruled Europe about two millennia ago, conquered Egypt, they stood amidst structures already 3,000 years old. This grand civilization concluded in 641 AD, fading into oblivion until its rediscovery in the 18th century. This is the story we will unfold. Let's begin. Ancient Egypt was a civilization of ancient Northeast Africa, concentrated along the lower reaches of the Nile River, situated in the place that is now the country, Egypt. Ancient Egyptian civilization followed prehistoric Egypt and coalesced around 3100 BC, according to conventional Egyptian chronology, with the political unification of Upper and Lower Egypt under Menes or Narmer. The history of ancient Egypt occurred as a series of stable kingdoms, separated by periods of relative instability known as intermediate periods. The Old Kingdom of the Early Bronze Age, the Middle Kingdom of the Middle Bronze Age, and the New Kingdom of the Late Bronze Age. Egypt reached the pinnacle of its power during the New Kingdom, ruling much of Nubia and a sizable portion of the Levant, after which it entered a period of slow decline. During the course of its history, Egypt was invaded or conquered by a number of foreign powers, including the Hyksos, the Nubians, the Assyrians, the Achaemenid Persians, and the Macedonians under Alexander the Great. The Greek Ptolemaic Kingdom, formed in the aftermath of Alexander's death, ruled Egypt until 30 BC, when, under Cleopatra, it fell to the Roman Empire and became a Roman province. Egypt remained under Rome and the successor Byzantine Empire until the 640s AD, when it was conquered by the Rashidun Caliphate. The success of ancient Egyptian civilization came partly from its ability to adapt to the conditions of the Nile River Valley for agriculture. The predictable flooding and controlled irrigation of the fertile valley produced surplus crops, which supported a more dense population and social development and culture. With resources to spare, the administration sponsored mineral exploitation of the valley and surrounding desert regions, the early development of an independent writing system, the organization of collective construction and agricultural projects, trade with surrounding regions, and a military intended to assert Egyptian dominance. Motivating and organizing these activities was a bureaucracy of elite scribes, religious leaders, and administrators under the control of a pharaoh, who ensured the cooperation and unity of the Egyptian people in the context of an elaborate system of religious beliefs. The many achievements of the ancient Egyptians include the quarrying, surveying, and construction techniques that supported the building of monumental pyramids, temples, and obelisks, a system of mathematics, a practical and effective system of medicine, irrigation systems, and agricultural production techniques, the first known planked boats, Egyptian faience and glass technology, new forms of literature, and the earliest known peace treaty, made with the Hittites. Ancient Egypt has left a lasting legacy. Its art and architecture were widely copied, and its antiquities were carried off to far corners of the world. Its monumental ruins have inspired the imaginations of travelers and writers for millennia. A newfound respect for antiquities and excavations in the early modern period by Europeans and Egyptians has led to the scientific investigation of Egyptian civilization, 
and a greater appreciation of its cultural legacy. Let's start our journey with the pre-dynastic period of Egypt. In pre-dynastic and early dynastic times, the Egyptian climate was much less arid than it is today. Large regions of Egypt were covered in treed savanna and traversed by herds of grazing ungulates. Foliage and fauna were far more prolific in all environs, and the Nile region supported large populations of waterfowl. Hunting would have been common for Egyptians, and this is also the period when many animals were first domesticated. By about 5500 BC, small tribes living in the Nile Valley had developed into a series of cultures, demonstrating firm control of agriculture and animal husbandry, and identifiable by their pottery and personal items, such as combs, bracelets, and beads. The largest of these early cultures in Upper Southern Egypt was the Badarian culture, which probably originated in the Western Desert. It was known for its high-quality ceramics, stone tools, and its use of copper. The Badari was followed by the Nakata culture, the Nakata I period, Amrayan, the Nakata II period, Gersa, and Nakata III period, Semenian. These brought a number of technological improvements. As early as the Nakata I period, pre-dynastic Egyptians imported obsidian from Ethiopia, used to shape blades and other objects from flakes. Mutual trade with the Levant was established during Nakata II, 3600-3350 BC. This period was also the beginning of trade with Mesopotamia, which continued into the early dynastic period and beyond. Over a period of about 1,000 years, the Nakata culture developed from a few small farming communities into a powerful civilization whose leaders were in complete control of the people and resources of the Nile Valley. Establishing a power center at Nakan, in Greek, Hierakonpolis, and later at Abydos, Nakata III. Periodic leaders expanded their control of Egypt northwards along the Nile. They also traded with Nubia to the south, the oases of the western desert to the west, and the cultures of the eastern Mediterranean and Near East to the east. The Nakata culture manufactured a diverse selection of material goods, reflective of the increasing power and wealth of the elite, as well as societal personal use items, which included combs, small statuary, painted pottery, high-quality decorative stone vases, cosmetic palettes, and jewelry made of gold, lapis, and ivory. They also developed a ceramic glaze known as faience, which was used well into the Roman period to decorate cups, amulets, and figurines. During the last pre-dynastic phase, the Nakata culture began using written symbols that eventually were developed into a full system of hieroglyphs for writing the ancient Egyptian language. Now we step further to the early dynastic period. The early dynastic period was approximately contemporary to the early Sumerian Akkadian civilization of Mesopotamia and of ancient Elam. The 3rd century BC Egyptian priest Manetho grouped the long line of kings from the first king Menes, his other name known as Narmer, to his own time into 30 dynasties, a system still used today. He began his official history with the king named Meni, or Menes in Greek, who was believed to have united the two kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt. The transition to a unified state happened more gradually than ancient Egyptian writers represented, and there is no contemporary record of Menes. Some scholars now believe, however, that the mythical Menes may have been the King Narmer, who is depicted wearing royal regalia on the ceremonial Narmer palette, in a symbolic act of unification. In the early dynastic period, which began about 3000 BC, the first of the dynastic kings solidified control over Lower Egypt by establishing a capital at Memphis from which he could control the labor force and agriculture of the fertile Delta region, as well as the lucrative and critical trade routes to the Levant. The increasing power and wealth of the kings during the early dynastic period was reflected in their elaborate mastaba tombs and mortuary cult structures at Abydos, which were used to celebrate the deified king after his death. The strong institution of kingship developed by the kings served to legitimize state control over the land, labor, and resources that were essential to the survival and growth of ancient Egyptian civilization. So, we begin our journey to the Old Kingdom from 2686 to 2181 BC. Major advances in architecture, art, and technology were made during the Old Kingdom. Fueled by the increased agricultural productivity and resulting population, made possible by a well-developed central administration. Some of ancient Egypt's crowning achievements, the Giza Pyramids and Great Sphinx, were constructed during the Old Kingdom. Under the direction of the vizier, state officials collected taxes, 
coordinated irrigation projects to improve crop yield, drafted peasants to work on construction projects, and established a justice system to maintain peace and order. With the rising importance of central administration in Egypt, a new class of educated scribes and officials arose who were granted estates by the king in payment for their services. Kings also made land grants to their mortuary cults and local temples to ensure that these institutions had the resources to worship the king after his death. Scholars believe that five centuries of these practices slowly eroded the economic vitality of Egypt and that the economy could no longer afford to support a large centralized administration. As the power of the kings diminished, regional governors called nomarchs began to challenge the supremacy of the office of king. This, coupled with severe droughts between 2200 and 2150 BC, is believed to have caused the country to enter the 140-year period of famine and strife, known as the First Intermediate Period. The First Intermediate Period lasted from 2181 to 2055 BC, so let's take a closer look. After Egypt's central government collapsed at the end of the Old Kingdom, the administration could no longer support or stabilize the country's economy. Regional governors could not rely on the king for help in times of crisis, and the ensuing food shortages and political disputes escalated into famines and small-scale civil wars. Yet despite difficult problems, local leaders, owing no tribute to the king, used their newfound independence to establish a thriving culture in the provinces. Once in control of their own resources, the provinces became economically richer, which was demonstrated by larger and better burials among all social classes. In bursts of creativity, provincial artisans adopted and adapted cultural motifs formerly restricted to the royalty of the Old Kingdom, and scribes developed literary styles that expressed the optimism and originality of the period. Free from their loyalties to the king, local rulers began competing with each other for territorial control and political power. By 2160 BC, rulers in Heracleopolis controlled Lower Egypt in the north, while a rival clan based in Thebes, the Intef family, took control of Upper Egypt in the south. As the Intefs grew in power and expanded their control northward, a clash between the two rival dynasties became inevitable. Around 2055 BC, the northern Theban forces under Nebhepetre Mentuhotep II finally defeated the Heracleopolitan rulers, reuniting the two lands. They inaugurated a period of economic and cultural renaissance known as the Middle Kingdom. And now we begin our journey to the Middle Kingdom from 2134 to 1690 BC. The kings of the Middle Kingdom restored the country's stability and prosperity, thereby stimulating a resurgence of art, literature, and monumental building projects. Mentuhotep II and his 11th dynasty successors ruled from Thebes, but the vizier Amenemhat I, upon assuming the kingship at the beginning of the 12th dynasty around 1985 BC, shifted the kingdom's capital to the city of Ichtawi, located in today's Fayyum. From Ichtawi, the kings of the 12th dynasty undertook a far-sighted land reclamation and irrigation scheme to increase agricultural output in the region. Moreover, the military reconquered territory in Nubia that was rich in quarries and gold mines, while laborers built a defensive structure in the eastern delta called the Walls of the Ruler to defend against foreign attack. With the kings having secured the country militarily and politically, and with vast agricultural and mineral wealth at their disposal, the nation's population, arts, and religion flourished. In contrast to elitist Old Kingdom attitudes towards the gods, the Middle Kingdom displayed an increase in expressions of personal piety. Middle Kingdom literature featured sophisticated themes and characters written in a confident, eloquent style. The relief and portrait sculpture of the period captured subtle, individual details that reached new heights of technical sophistication. The last great ruler of the Middle Kingdom, Amenemhat III, allowed Semitic-speaking Canaanite settlers from the Near East into the Delta region to provide a sufficient labor force for his especially active mining and building campaigns. These ambitious building and mining activities, however, combined with severe Nile floods later in his reign, strained the economy and precipitated the slow decline into the Second Intermediate Period during the later 13th and 14th dynasties. During this decline, the Canaanite settlers began to assume greater control of the Delta region, eventually coming to power in Egypt as the Hyksos. And now we are in the middle of the Second Intermediate Period from 1674 to 1549 BC. Around 1785 BC, as the power of the Middle Kingdom kings weakened, a Western Asian people called the Hyksos, 
who had already settled in the Delta, seized control of Egypt and established their capital at Avaris, forcing the former central government to retreat to Thebes. The king was treated as a vassal and expected to pay tribute. The Hyksos, which means foreign rulers, retained Egyptian models of government and identified as kings, thereby integrating Egyptian elements into their culture. They and other invaders introduced new tools of warfare into Egypt, most notably the composite bow and the horse-drawn chariot. After retreating south, the native Theban kings found themselves trapped between the Canaanite Hyksos ruling the north and the Hyksos Nubian allies, the Kushites, to the south. After almost a hundred years of vassalage, Thebes gathered enough strength to challenge the Hyksos in a conflict that lasted more than 30 years, until 1555 BC. The kings Sekinenre Tau II and Kamose were ultimately able to defeat the Nubians to the south of Egypt, but failed to defeat the Hyksos. That task fell to Kamose's successor, Amozi I, who successfully waged a series of campaigns that permanently eradicated the Hyksos's presence in Egypt. He established a new dynasty, and, in the new kingdom that followed, the military became a central priority for the kings, who sought to expand Egypt's borders and attempted to gain mastery of the Near East. With this act, the era of the New Kingdom begun. Let's start our journey to the New Kingdom, from 1549 to 1069 BC. The New Kingdom pharaohs established a period of unprecedented prosperity by securing their borders and strengthening diplomatic ties with their neighbors, including the Mitanni Empire, Assyria, and Canaan. Military campaigns waged under Tuthmosis I and his grandson Tuthmosis III extended the influence of the pharaohs to the largest empire Egypt had ever seen. Beginning with Merneptah, the rulers of Egypt adopted the title of pharaoh. Between their reigns, Hatshepsut, a queen who established herself as pharaoh, launched many building projects, including the restoration of temples damaged by the Hyksos, and sent trading expeditions to Punt and the Sinai. When Tuthmosis III died in 1425 BC, Egypt had an empire extending from Nia in northwest Syria to the fourth cataract of the Nile in Nubia, cementing loyalties and opening access to critical imports such as bronze and wood. The New Kingdom pharaohs began a large-scale building campaign to promote the god Amun, whose growing cult was based in Karnak. They also constructed monuments to glorify their own achievements, both real and imagined. The Karnak Temple is the largest Egyptian temple ever built. Around 1350 BC, the stability of the New Kingdom was threatened when Amenhotep IV ascended the throne and instituted a series of radical and chaotic reforms. Changing his name to Akhenaten or Eknaten, he touted the previously obscure sun deity Aten as the supreme deity, suppressed the worship of most other deities, and moved the capital to the new city of Akhetaten, modern-day Amarna. He was devoted to his new religion and artistic style. After his death, the cult of the Aten was quickly abandoned and the traditional religious order restored. The subsequent pharaohs, Tutankhamun, Ai, and Horemheb, worked to erase all mention of Akhenaten's heresy, now known as the Amarna period. Around 1279 BC, Rameses II, also known as Rameses the Great, ascended the throne and went on to build more temples, erect more statues and obelisks, and sire more children than any other pharaoh in history. A bold military leader, Rameses II, led his army against the Hittites in the Battle of Kadesh in modern Syria and, after fighting to a stalemate, finally agreed to the first recorded peace treaty around 1258 BC. Egypt's wealth, however, made it a tempting target for invasion, particularly by the Libyan Berbers to the west and the Sea Peoples, a conjectured confederation of seafarers from the Aegean Sea. Initially, the military was able to repel these invasions, but Egypt eventually lost control of its remaining territories in southern Canaan, much of it falling to the Assyrians. The effects of external threats were exacerbated by internal problems such as corruption, tomb robbery, and civil unrest. After regaining their power, the high priests at the Temple of Amun in Thebes accumulated vast tracts of land and wealth, and their expanded power splintered the country during the Third Intermediate Period. Now we are in the middle of our journey of the Third Intermediate Period, from 1069 to 653 BC. Following the death of Rameses XI in 1078 BC, Smendes assumed authority over the northern part of Egypt, ruling from the city of Tanis. 
The South was effectively controlled by the high priests of Amun at Thebes, who recognized Smendes in name only. During this time, Libyans had been settling in the western delta, and chieftains of these settlers began increasing their autonomy. Libyan princes took control of the delta under Shoshenk I in 945 BC, founding the so-called Libyan or Bubastite dynasty that would rule for some 200 years. Shoshenk also gained control of southern Egypt by placing his family members in important priestly positions. Libyan control began to erode as a rival dynasty in the delta arose in Leontopolis, and Cushites threatened from the south. Around 727 BC, the Kushite king Pie invaded northward, seizing control of Thebes and eventually the delta, which established the 25th dynasty. During the 25th dynasty, Pharaoh Taharqa created an empire nearly as large as the New Kingdoms. 25th dynasty pharaohs built, or restored, temples and monuments throughout the Nile Valley, including at Memphis, Karnak, Kawa, and Jebel Barkal. During this period, the South Nile Valley saw the second widespread construction of pyramids, many in modern Sudan, since the Middle Kingdom. Egypt's far-reaching prestige declined considerably toward the end of the Third Intermediate Period. Its foreign allies had fallen under the Assyrian sphere of influence, and by 700 BC war between the two states became inevitable. Between 671 and 667 BC, the Assyrians began the Assyrian conquest of Egypt. The reigns of both Taharqa and his successor, Tanutamun, were filled with constant conflict with the Assyrians, against whom Egypt enjoyed several victories. However, the Assyrians pushed the Kushites back into Nubia, occupied Memphis, and sacked the temples of Thebes. After the Assyrian conquest, we start to discuss the late period, from 653 to 332 BC. The Assyrians left control of Egypt to a series of vassals, who became known as the Sate Kings of the 26th Dynasty. By 653 BC, the Sate King Samtik I was able to oust the Assyrians with the help of Greek mercenaries, who were recruited to form Egypt's first navy. Greek influence expanded greatly as the city-state of Naukratis became the home of Greeks in the Nile Delta. The Sate Kings, based in the new capital of Sais, witnessed a brief but spirited resurgence in the economy and culture. But in 525 BC, the powerful Persians, led by Cambyses II, began their conquest of Egypt, eventually capturing the pharaoh Samtik III at the Battle of Pelusium. Cambyses II then assumed the formal title of pharaoh, but ruled Egypt from Iran, leaving Egypt under the control of a satrap. A few successful revolts against the Persians marked the 5th century BC, but Egypt was never able to permanently overthrow the Persians. Following its annexation by Persia, Egypt was joined with Cyprus and Phoenicia in the sixth satrapy of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. This first period of Persian rule over Egypt, also known as the 27th Dynasty, ended in 402 BC, when Egypt regained independence under a series of native dynasties. The last of these dynasties, the 30th, proved to be the last native royal house of ancient Egypt, ending with the kingship of Nectanebo II. A brief restoration of Persian rule, sometimes known as the 31st Dynasty, began in 343 BC. But shortly after, in 332 BC, the Persian ruler Mazasis handed Egypt over to Alexander the Great without a fight. This act was the beginning of the Ptolemaic period from 332 to 30 BC. In 332 BC, Alexander the Great conquered Egypt with little resistance from the Persians and was welcomed by the Egyptians as a deliverer. The administration established by Alexander's successors, the Macedonian Ptolemaic Kingdom, was based on an Egyptian model and based in the new capital city of Alexandria. The city showcased the power and prestige of Hellenistic rule and became a center of learning and culture that included the famous Library of Alexandria as part of the Mausion. The famous lighthouse of Alexandria lit the way for the many ships that kept trade flowing through the city. As the Ptolemies made commerce and revenue-generating enterprises, such as papyrus manufacturing, their top priority. Hellenistic culture did not supplant native Egyptian culture, as the Ptolemies supported time-honored traditions in an effort to secure the loyalty of the populace. They built new temples in Egyptian style, supported traditional cults, and portrayed themselves as pharaohs. Some traditions merged, as Greek and Egyptian gods were syncretized into composite deities, such as Serapis, 
and classical Greek forms of sculpture influenced traditional Egyptian motifs. Despite their efforts to appease the Egyptians, the Ptolemies were challenged by native rebellion, bitter family rivalries, and the powerful mob of Alexandria that formed after the death of Ptolemy IV. In addition, as Rome relied more heavily on imports of grain from Egypt, the Romans took great interest in the political situation in the country. Continued Egyptian revolts, ambitious politicians, and powerful opponents from the Near East made this situation unstable, leading Rome to send forces to secure the country as a province of its empire. This act started the Roman and later the Byzantine period from 30 BC to AD 641 Egypt became a province of the Roman Empire in 30 BC. Following the defeat of Mark Antony and Ptolemaic Queen Cleopatra VII by Octavian, later Emperor Augustus, in the Battle of Actium, the Romans relied heavily on grain shipments from Egypt and the Roman army, under the control of a prefect appointed by the emperor, quelled rebellions, strictly enforced the collection of heavy taxes, and prevented attacks by bandits, which had become a notorious problem during the period. Alexandria became an increasingly important center on the trade route with the Orient, as exotic luxuries were in high demand in Rome. Although the Romans had a more hostile attitude than the Greeks towards the Egyptians, some traditions such as mummification and worship of the traditional gods continued. The art of mummy portraiture flourished, and some Roman emperors had themselves depicted as pharaohs, though not to the extent that the Ptolemies had. The former lived outside Egypt and did not perform the ceremonial functions of Egyptian kingship. Local administration became Roman in style and closed to native Egyptians. From the mid-first century AD, Christianity took root in Egypt and it was originally seen as another cult that could be accepted. However, it was an uncompromising religion that sought to win converts from the pagan Egyptian and Greco-Roman religions and threatened popular religious traditions. This led to the persecution of converts to Christianity, culminating in the great purges of Diocletian starting in 303 AD but eventually Christianity won out with Constantine I. In 391 AD, the Christian emperor Theodosius introduced legislation that banned pagan rites and closed temples. Alexandria became the scene of great anti-pagan riots with public and private religious imagery destroyed. As a consequence, Egypt's native religious culture was continually in decline. While the native population continued to speak their language, the ability to read hieroglyphic writing slowly disappeared as the role of the Egyptian temple priests and priestesses diminished, the temples themselves were sometimes converted to churches or abandoned to the desert. In the 4th century, as the Roman Empire divided, Egypt found itself in the Eastern Empire with its capital at Constantinople. In the waning years of the empire, Egypt fell to the Sasanian Persian army in the Sasanian conquest of Egypt from 618 to 628 AD. It was then recaptured by the Byzantine emperor Heraclius, from 629 to 639 AD, and was finally captured by Muslim Rashidun army in 641 AD, marking the end of both Byzantine rule and of the period typically considered as ancient Egypt.